Hi, how are you? I'm good. 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 How are you? All right. <laughs> Jesse was able to make it. Hello, Jesse. Hey, um, I'm kind of just getting ready. Okay. Yeah. But then I'm. I don't think it's going to take very long, but it's like a last minute thing. All right. So, um, but I'll be, I'll be around or trying to look there at least. Actually. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Okay, well, welcome to the meeting and uh, hope everyone's doing well. And uh, even if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, we can always talk about it in the Slack. It's probably a better place to kind of bring things up uh, discussion-wise, uh, if you want to get the full lab, the lab's attention, um, but nevertheless, so Jesse and I met yesterday, um, He we talked about some research directions, so we'll be talking a little bit about like maybe what we'll be doing in the next, you know, over the fall, we'll kind of preview some of that. Uh, we'll also talk about some papers and, and uh, a couple of submission items that are coming up in the next month or so. So, um, are there any questions before we start? Or? Okay. All right. So, I'll share my screen to start with. And, uh, Okay. So can you see my screen? Okay, so if, uh, all right, so you should be able to see my screen. And uh, uh, I, I can't. Oh, there it is. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. So uh, this, is, this is the an old post here, but I think it's interesting because it's kind of talking about some of the things we were talking about in our meeting yesterday. Um, so this was from May 12th, and Jesse said, chance I start trying to implement or reproduce toy things like this. So this is papers with code. This is the animal AI training environment. So I, I think actually this has been brought up a couple times by people. And so this is, um, I don't know if people are aware, but there are a lot of there are at least two or three uh, different types of sort of training environments that have been developed uh, by bigger groups, you know, like OpenAI or some of these other groups. And the idea is, you know, they have these uh, sort of test beds where you can take things and um, try them out. So if you're interested in implementing a, an algorithm, say like a reinforcement learning algorithm, that's great. And you can try it out on your in your notebook and it'll you know you can get some summary statistics and whatever but it's actually works better if you put it in one of these environments and so this is uh, actually this is the PDF let's see if we can find uh, look at that a little bit uh, yeah this is the animal AI environment training and testing animal like artificial cognition and so they're able to take their algorithm and put it into this virtual world here. This is an arena where you have all these objects and you have an agent that explores the arena. And you know it embed it embodies the algorithm much better than if you just run it in a notebook. And this is of course for reinforcement learning, so you're able to configure your task and do other things that you know you would do if you were running, say, a behavioral experiment. Um, now, for reinforcement learning, that's particularly important. Um, but there are other, you know, algorithms you can run in some of these environments as well. And uh, I, I'm sure people are familiar with the video game benchmarks. So, there, you know, there's been uh, uh, a great interest in recent years in recreating some of the old Atari video games and using them as test beds for reinforcement learning algorithms. So those are things that are, I, I guess, openly available. I don't think we have the links directly in our materials, but maybe that's something we should, uh, like I was showing you this uh, this uh, web page, I think last week or the week before, where we talked about different resources for 
learning about uh, data science and, and AI. So maybe we should put a link to that in, in those materials or maybe in one of the GitHub repositories. I'll just make a note here. So there's that. Um, and I think that would be uh, a nice way for people to sort of participate, you know, to implement things that we talk about in the meetings and maybe try out different types of uh, approaches. So here's DeepMindLab. This is one example of this where they have uh, Quake, which is a, a video, a classic video game, uh, Quake 3 Arena. So you have this arena. It, the work has already been done in terms of creating the environment. You just need to plug in your agent. So um, that's that's nice. I think we should revisit that. Um, let me see. I'm just making another note here. All right. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was in this channel here, Call for Involvement. And this is actually, again, back from December 7th in 2020. And so this was kind of recalling what we might be doing this year. So for 2021, from the perspective of December of 2020. And I know we've done a lot of things like since then and, and things have evolved. But let's see what we were thinking back then. So... Uh, so Timor, some thoughts about what is ahead. There are so many different potential projects we could be developing into 2021. Uh, we should take some time to hash them out. And I think we did that with our project cards. We have some project cards uh, for different projects uh, that, that are in the lab. And, and it's not you know exhaustive, but there are different things that we've talked about or, or sort of done papers and talks on in the past. So. Um, and those are actually on the Twitter feed. If you go back and you look, you'll find some advertisements for those. Um, actual projects that would test some ideas and research them. Some of the cataloging things I'm doing in Cognition Futures. So this is the stuff that uh, sort of culminated in the uh, workshop that we had a couple weeks ago. Um, and so now Avery's allostasis work, unifying some things in the AI neurospace, past ties to virtual reality neurotech, Bradley being hype about the continuous learning tutorial, a throwback to Sam Felder's older work came up recently, and no less the actual developmental AI and metabrain models. So that was uh, all interesting, and I think we've done some of that. We've done the, uh, we've moved cognition futures forward a bit. Um, I think definitely there's that, we have that uh, discussion group for posterity, now we need to follow up on that. But I think we moved the ball on that quite a bit. Um, the allostasis work, so we did actually do the allostasis machines uh, presentation in the uh, uh, the uh, workshop that we had for that. Um, and we have, we've never really done anything in virtual reality and neurotech. We talked about it a lot, which is maybe good. It's just kind of forming a presence, but we need to, maybe that's, that's an area we could, uh, bolster our work in our credentials or something. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't know what people are thinking about with that, but I'm definitely interested in hearing people's opinions. If there's some topic you really want to tackle, it's, you know, it's probably not enough. We don't really have a lot of high technology. You know, we can't, like, do these, you know, uh, in, you know, super impressive demos like some of the VR groups um, where that's, I mean, in, in VR, there's a lot of focus on these overwhelming demos that are just really sharp technically, but there isn't really any scientific substance to it it's in the sense of like, you know, what questions are you asking? So that's something that maybe we could do. And we don't even need to have a virtual environment to do that. There a number of issues that involve, you know, representation. And uh, like I just showed, you know, you can create training beds, uh, you know, have discussions about environment as a input for cognition and things like that. So it's definitely something we can follow up on. Uh, we need to have some conversations about that to sort of frame the questions. 
Uh, the continuous learning stuff, that's, uh, we're going to turn back to that in the next week or two because we want to submit this paper to uh, the special journal issue for uh, the EI workshop. So we have the, and I'll get into this later, we have a couple things uh, to follow up from on that. Uh, this is the paper that was submitted to uh, it was submitted to a NURPS workshop and then it, or the Baby Minds workshop, if you remember that from last year, and then it was submitted to Artificial Life. And, you know, we really didn't find our footing in either of those submissions. So just keep working on that and, and uh, building upon it. Um, but I think that's an, an some idea, another idea we need to maybe uh, push a little bit harder on. Um, and then this stuff about uh, Sam Felder's older work, this is this uh the contextual geometric structures work which is something maybe we'll be talking about in the next couple weeks with a submission to uh the uh, pragmatics uh workshop at nereps uh and then and i need to bring some well actually i'll talk about those materials today and then the developmental way i met a brain models so that's something else we're working on so i think we're kind of coming along on all those fronts. And to add to that, I think we also have the um, AI ethics work. So if the AI ethics work is, uh, you know, we've done, a, 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 I think we've pushed that forward in the last maybe a year. So I think that's, you know, keep revisiting that and keep working on that. Uh, keep thinking about things you might want to push forward on that. Um, if you go back to, the best way to do that is to go back to a talk look at what was covered and then try to find maybe two or three slides where you can, you know, follow up on it. So this wasn't very clear. Where there's some interesting questions from these slides, let's move that forward. So that's how you, you do those sorts of things. And, and I think, you know, uh, like the, the AI ethics, uh, the talk was very broad, had a lot of different perspectives. So that's always good, but you also want to be able to drill down into some of these things. So I think, yeah, in terms of planning, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of continuity that we can follow up on. Um, but I also wanted to point out that, you know, we, maybe we have specific uh, positions that we want to fill in the lab. And, and by positions, I don't necessarily mean paid positions, but I mean, I'm thinking in terms of, and Jesse, we talked about this yesterday, thinking in terms of like people doing specific things in the lab or roles in the lab. So one of the things we talked about was like uh, something like a model builder. Um, so that would be someone who would take ideas that people have uh, and turn them into models, working models. So by models, I mean reinforcement learning models or deep learning models or whatever. Now we can do that, you know, that doesn't have to be one person actually. That could be a, maybe even a small team if people wanted to uh, join forces on this. But the idea would be to have like this emphasis on a certain sort of task. Um, you know, we could also do like data analysis, analyst. Although I think model builder for what we've been talking about in a lot of our meetings makes a little bit more sense. But um, again, it would just be someone who has this interest in some area, very defined area, just grab that area and try to take ownership of it. So, you know, if, if uh, Angela, want, you know, has a set of skills uh, that she wants to use for something that, you know, she wants to specialize in a set of skills, uh, then, you know, that would be the thing that you would sort of propose, oh, I can do this. And then that would be like, you know, it would be like specializing a little bit and contributing to the lab that way. And, you know, so if someone's, you know, I don't know, say you were doing uh, eval something called evaluation or you look over someone's research idea or maybe even their um, startup idea, and, you know, and then that would be something that you would, you know, that would be the go-to person in the lab for that. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's what I'm thinking of. And again, these wouldn't necessarily be paid positions but there's sort of the, the flip side of the project cards in that the project cards spell out the different projects, but this is the way to sort of spell out the roles that people can take. And so it just jibes maybe with their 
uh, existing skills or maybe they want to build a new skill. And so that's a good way to do it too. To have like a, you know, say oh, I'm really interested in building models. I want to try my hand at some of these uh, virtual environments and I want to start a, a, a reinforcement learning, I want to go on a reinforcement learning JAG and I want to start implementing some things. And then of course, people, other people in the level of ideas of what you can implement and then you know, the critically, you want to follow up on it. You don't want to just say, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and then never get to the end point. Um, that's never good. So, you know, we want to make sure that we can follow up on it and, you know, integrate it into the meeting. So uh, we would have like some time. Well, yes, model builder is here and they're going to, I mean, I don't want to call out people's identities, but uh, model builder is here and they're going to like show us their demo and that's <laughs> that would be nice to have um but you know that's that's so that's something we're thinking about for uh furthering involvement planning for the fall so let me move are there any questions about that or comments I think this is um, a good step forward for things, and I, uh, over the next week or so, I, I want to flesh out some of the descriptions for, for, for the projects and also for some of the, the roles that we're talking about, because I think that's, I think a little structure and a little sort of, you know, um, giving space and structure and uh, a little focus on um, on these things will go a long way. And also just, there's, there's so many different aspects of things um, that we're doing that I think, and one of the things I did mention is to be like, I think I'm going to create, maybe with the help of Notion, a little bit more of like a, a site map because things we do overlap and the products and product descriptions are, you know, one thing. But kind of seeing, you know, that you could you could have a specific role for an extended time with model builder or I'm kind of just looking for an assistant lab manager um, or someone who's interested in like administrative stuff. Um, we, we need we need someone doing specific work on um, like like uh, there's a lot of data analysis things that could be done in terms of uh, the ethics team. Um, there's like uh, you know, uh, we've had we've had some specific topics in cognition futures come up that it'd be great to have someone just become an expert in that and do weekly weekly reports and in, in, in that and um, like a new shirt is kind of fitting that role in one of those things, but just kind of creating like it, it's really it's going to be really important uh, for the next you know by by September I think it's going to be really important to advertise and say hey. We have an opening for this role or this um, set of projects. You know, commit commit a semester to this, and you can get some experience here. And I think I think that would be, you know, I think all this is good preparation for for doing that and sort of putting our, you know, getting ourselves ready for that. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, definitely. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have to advertise them, of course. <laughs> but even within the lab, I think people are maybe unsure how they can contribute. So that's, it's always good to have, like, think internally as well. Um, I mean, by internally, I mean the Slack and soliciting people who are already kind of here. Um, but yeah, I think it's, that's definitely, we, you know, we should move forward on that. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, let me share my screen again. Yeah, it might also be good to think about like just very popular skill sets. Like I was talking, like Shruti actually just got back to me this morning and said she's just working on like in a segmentation for like certain like, like cancer or other things. And I don't know if we're going to be doing a lot of image segmentation for ourselves based on what we have, but like, um, you know, uh, like thinking about in, the, in these role description, thinking about particular um, 
skills that, that they could they could be developing and things like that. And, and just like highlighting, hey, here's the project, here's the arena, here's the context, but a lot of people just want to, you know, some people may have said, oh, I just want to develop a skill rather than a topical area. So having ways to kind of communicate both of those things is good. Okay. Uh, I may be unable to talk for the next little bit, so if I don't respond, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so that's good. Thank you for that. Um, let me reshare my screen. Um, now let's go back to Cognition Futures here. So this is... Uh, okay, so actually, I, I uh, this one here, this was yesterday from 9th. Okay, so this was... I'm trying to find the beginning of last week. So this is all this week. Okay. So this is the Atlas of Forecasts. This is something I put in the channel. This is something by Katie Borner, who does a lot of visualization um, in informatics. And so this is a modeling and mapping of desirable futures. So this is using advanced data models and visualizations to forecast the future. So uh, to envision and create the futures we want, society needs an appropriate understanding of the likely impact of alternative actions. So this is something we talk about in cognition futures in, in an academic sense, like to understand an academic field, but you know, we can do this for the real world as well, like for different societies in the world in general. So uh, data models and visualizations offer a way to understand and intelligently manage complex interlinked systems in science and technology, education and policy making. So this just shows us, this book shows us how we can use data to predict, communicate, and attain desirable futures. And so this is the idea here behind this atlas. Um, I don't know, it's probably, you yeah, know, this is a book by MIT Press, so it's not probably available online, but um, it's just, you know, just to see what other people are doing here um, in the area of uh, forecasting and future prediction and things like that. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of going through a lot of things that, you know, make up a future prediction. So you take all of the sort of trends, you take a lot of the, um, you know, predictions about, you know, what kinds of advances are made in science and technology. You take a lot of things about, we know about like how people behave, a lot about the historical trends, which we can then extrapolate out to the future. So that's, you know, and then this is a notoriously hard area because sometimes you get, um, you know, very good predictions and sometimes they're way off. So as you may well know, uh, you know, forecasting the future is, you know, sometimes people are pretty far off. Sometimes they're not that far off at all. If you go back to Jules Verne, for example, you know, a lot of things that Jules Verne talked about, you know, came true to some extent, you know, and that was just because he observed the trends that were going on. He thought about things that were likely to happen, maybe things that, you know, um, uh, things that were plausible maybe, but maybe not so plausible. And just, you know, and of course there's this feedback between people reading his work and then being inspired by it to create the things that he talked about. So, you know, there's that aspect of it too, that the predictions we make, if people are viewing it, you know, 50 years from now, uh, they may want to actually emulate some of the better predictions, some of the more optimistic predictions. And so you have that effect as well. So interesting stuff. Uh, this is the Johan John uh, tweet about in defense of placeholders. And I, if I bring this up. This is something Jesse brought up yesterday. I bring this up with uh, thinking about what happened with the tweet, which was that people started responding to it and there's some pretty robust responses to it. This morning I actually saw some robust responses to this. So this is uh, something that Johan John uh, put out in defense of placeholders. I don't know if this is his paper or not. I don't think it is, but let me take a look at this. Oh, this is, yeah, this is his blog post. So this is uh, Johan John, we've talked about him before. Uh, in defense of placeholders, is a case of representation so we talk about representation in the group, but you know, what does that mean? And, you know, is it something that we actually need? And 
<clears throat> so in cognitive science, there's this idea of anti-representationism. And we talk about things like connectionism as being a low representation framework. But there's actually an active case to be made with uh, connectionism for anti-representation. That is, you don't really need representation to emulate cognition, you just need this connectivity. And so that's, and a lot of cognitive scientists, I think, believe that uh, to some extent. I don't think there are any radicals who don't think of any role for representation, but uh, and some of the tweet responses that were on Twitter this morning, people said, well, you know, it's very hard to define a representation and things like that. So there, there are sort of both sides of the story, but I think Johan goes through and, and kind of defends representationism a little bit. Um, the idea that the brain represents objects, processes, and events in the body, and the outside world is ubiquitous. It may be the pre-theoretical default for anyone who believes that the brain, rather than some incorporeal soul, is the seat of perception, intelligence, and voluntary behavior. So you have to remember that before connectionism and before representationism, people thought that there was some incorporeal um, mechanism that we, you know, was probably supernatural that controlled behavior. Um, and then I think one of the things that psychology showed was that, you know, these are all processes in the brain that are controlled by maybe biochemical processes or other processes that are natural in, in orientation. And so, but then the question is, is, okay, well, then how do we generate you know, thought. It isn't just maybe through, you know, uh, through sort of collective bio, uh, biochemistry or, you know, connectionism, there's got to be something else. And so there's that, that's where this kind of, if you think about this debate coming out of that, it makes, you know, some sense and it actually is informative. Um, but you don't have to spend too, too long in neuroscience circles these days to come across anti-representationalists. They claim that the brain doesn't represent anything at all, and that there are other ways to explain how the brain contributes to perception, thought, and behavior. So the first exponent of the anti-representationalism group that I encountered as a, was a philosopher. So for some years, I assumed that discomfort with representation was a result of confusing a pragmatically defined neuroscience concept with a metaphysical bugbear, which means that it's just some issue like I was talking about. Uh, that there's this metaphysical aspect um, that hold over when we think about representations. Uh, the idea that the mind is only indirect access to the world. I thought perhaps naively that mechanistic question of what the brain does with the energetic patterns impinging on it could be divorced from the philosophical question. Um, and then in the past year or two, I discovered that the philo uh, philosopher's quibbles about representation had begun to infect neuroscience. So he's in favor of metaphysical circumspection, uh, like, our fact, like the fact that our notions of causation, agency, and emergence rem remain hotly contested. But questioning the status of representation seems to generate more heat than light. So that means it's you know more controversial than we actually get useful answers out of it. And so, um, you know, representation is a pretty vague concept um, and, you know, it, it's sort of like information and emergence or like, you know, even mechanism, uh, which, you know, they're all words that we use, but we, you know, we ha and a lot of people have definitions for them, but even if you have a definition, you know, if you go across works, sometimes the definition is different. Sometimes the meaning is that the intent is different when say we say that something is information like we talk about uh, in our group, we talk about Gibsonian information. And I don't think we've defined that down as well as we could. Um, I also think, you know, that there are other types of information in the brain, like, you know, there's Shannon information, which is sort of the information theory that it talks about, but that's a specific type of information. So, you know, when we say information, we mean a lot of different things. Sometimes it isn't even mathematical. It's just this, you know, um, something that isn't random. So, um, so anti-representationalism has set itself up as a radical alternative to mainstream cognitive science. Uh, can sometimes have quasi-political undertones that are catnip to latent iconoclasts and revolutionaries. 
that's an interesting phrase, but <laughs> um, so, you know, this kind of goes on about like neural representations and kind of talks about how they're sort of positioned in this world of then um, this debate. So, and then, you know, it gets in what representations actually are. So, you know, is a representation that activity in the brain correlates with perception or recognition, or is it something deeper than that? Because, you know, uh, correlation is, is somewhat weak statistically. It isn't causal. And it just basically tells you, it's not like, you know, it's not that it, it's basically a co-occurrence that occurs a lot of times. If you make a bunch of observations, it co-occurs a bunch of times and we say it's correlated and we put a number on it. But essentially that isn't causal, nor is it really, it doesn't tell us whether that correlation is spurious or not, or whether it's just kind of there because there are two things that co-occur. So we don't really know, uh, whether something is, you know, if it's, it's two things correlate, whether they represent the strong uh, attachment to one another. So um, this is just kind of goes over maybe also what representation is. There are other types of like uh, tests for representation, like, um, you know, that people have come up with, but again, those things aren't widely applied whenever someone talks about representation. So you know, it's not a uniform thing. Um, so let's see, what is nice about the speculative excerpt, and this is the thing I just glossed over here, is that the connection between motor control and thought, neatly skipping the fraud issue of perception and the direct indirect business, gives us a mechanistic picture of what neural representation means to the author, and many people will think like him. So, the, yeah, there are terms like represented in the brain, or neural representation or neural change or activity corresponding to a thought. So those are all things that we kind of, you know, terms that are used to say this is a representation. And again, that's not really that rigorous. It's just kind of like we observe this thing in the brain. There's this behavior. We can assume there's a representation. It doesn't really tell us about like, you know, how efficient it is or, you know, if it did there sometimes representations drift. Uh, does that happen over time? You know, all the, there are all these issues that we have to deal with. So um, I don't really have a horse in this race, so I don't know what to say about it. But um, the point is that the anti-rep crowd is very likely to be misfiring if they assume that a neuroscientist use of the concept of representation derives from the something from something in the work of Herbert Simon and Alan Newell, Noam Chomsky, George Miller, Jerry Fodor. And those are all people like Herman's, Herbert Simon and Alan Newell were, you know, AI people. Uh, George Miller and Jerry Fodor are psychologists or neuroscientists. So, uh, you know, these are kind of people who, uh, you know, they, well, they're all kind of like interested in the, the mind or, you know, they might be interested in a computational model or an AI model. So, you know, they're not necessarily just observing the brain. They're observing like these models as well as the brain. And so um, they have a little bit different take on it. Um, the lineage of representation in neuroscience is far older than the apparent revolution of the 1950s, which was the changeover from behaviorism to cognitivism. Uh, where people started thinking about like the issues of cognitivism as a, as a viable path forward, um, which is really just restored to psychology as a notion that people tended to arrive at as soon as they became acquainted with the idea of the brain as a basis for experience. So representation is sort of uh, aligned with the shift towards cognitivism. Um, and so that's an interesting point. Um, I have not met, yet made clear a clear case for the meaningfulness of representation in quotes beyond the general point about the acceptability of placeholders in science. So, you know, a placeholder is a term that we use when we don't necessarily know what to say about something and we say this is a representation. So is this like something that we just use as a placeholder for something we don't understand or are we really sincere about saying representation? So this, of course, ignited a, a large amount of controversy, and uh, I think that's a great, a great 
find Jesse, um, and I think it's something we should revisit, and especially with this Metabrains Models paper, which is, you know, where we're stacking different levels of representation on top of one another. But at least there, I think, well, I think in that case, given this uh, debate, we do need to really refine what we mean by representation. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's always worth defining things pretty tightly. Um, you can never go wrong with that. I, although you can't actually go wrong with it if your whole argument rests on sort of some inconsistency in your tight definition. But anyways, uh, that's that's something, that's another discussion. So, um, but, but we'll try to make that, like, you know, make it non-inconsistent. So, um, but I, no, I definitely think that something like a representation, it, you know, deserves its a very tight definition around it. Uh, Jesse also found this cognition and context lab. This is a group-based out of UC Davis, so you can look at that if you're interested in looking at what other labs are doing and, you know, they have some interesting stuff going on there. Um, I'm not sure there's anything new in these uh, channels here. If we have anything in cybernetics. Nope. Um, developmental AI. Nothing new there, I don't think. Um, anything in ethics, tech, and society. This is something that's posted Thursday. Uh, something I posted. Yeah. This is... Uh, Something I think Jesse posted to Twitter. This is the moral consideration of artificial entities, a literature review. So this is something for uh, the ethics in, in, people interested in the ethics project. project. Um, this is moral consideration of artificial entities. This is a nice literature review on artificial entities such as robots uh, that weren't rights or their forms of moral consideration. So this is a synthesis of research on the topic so far. This was published in Science and Engineering Ethics this year. So they kind of talk about like some of the issues that are involved in this, these, these uh, moral conundrums um, beyond the conventional consequentialist uh, frameworks. Some scholars encourage information ethics and social relational approaches that are opportunities for more in-depth ethical research on the nuances of moral consideration of artificial entities. So there isn't a lot of data on this, but they're doing a lot of development of, of concepts. Um, so that's, I think that's a good read if you're interested in that area. Um, I don't think we have much more here. Um, I don't think anything much in the general channel. Um, Metabrain models, I think was pretty quiet. We had open chat forum, so that uh, I don't think there was anything new in there, though. Um, and I think that virtual reality in neurotech has been quiet as well. So, okay, Angela left. Um, thank you for attending, Angela. So this is Jesse and I. So, um, so that's all we have for the Slack review. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Jesse, to this, or if you're able to talk. Well, in any case, I know you're busy with the uh, moving and that, but uh, we can talk about it a little bit later if we have time. Um, let's see. Uh, why don't I move on to... So, yeah, I wanted to show that where we have... I want to go back and revisit our uh, GitHub repo a little bit. So we have this. Oh, you're back. You're back. Uh, it's me. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi, Avery. Hi. How are you? How was your week? Pretty good. Kind of hectic. I'm exhausted, but it's been good. Good. How's your? How How is everything going in England? You're at the uh, the. What is the the uh, hostel, science hostel or something? It's like an EA hotel slash center for enabling EA research. Okay. Yep. It's, it's still good. We are... Oh, 
pro- we are we start we started a digital minimalism project this month, so I've been strongly limiting digital media, and hopefully that will increase my productivity. Yeah, that's always good. I mean, that's always a good thing to kind of if you want to focus on questions and work that limit your uh, consumption of. <laughs> yep. Well, that's good. And you're finding that to be a productive place to... Uh, yeah. A lot of people here are interested in AI alignment, uh, aging, co- consciousness, neuroscience. It's a, it's a stimulating place to be. Yeah. Body and what? It sounds pretty good. Um, do you see, like, uh, do you have anything you're working on specifically or anything you're really excited about? Um, I'm, I'm basically just continuing what I was previously doing. Um, I want to possibly get my toes into agent-based modeling. But besides that, just also working on foundations while I'm here so I can build, so I can things are more bigger yeah yeah i think that's great yeah well thanks it's for that time. oh was that it's very really nice this environment in general tomorrow we're playing something like the dungeons and dragons for the first time oh. yeah <laughs> sounds pretty good yep well, yeah, I'm glad that you've found a good place to, uh, you know, physically interact with people and, and get some work done. It's always an important uh, aspect of, you know, doing this kind of work is, you know, you have to have a good uh, environment to do it in. And so, you know, doing things virtually, we often have the sort of the physical end of it that we don't, <laughs> we can't really control that much. But like if you have like a residential location that you can rely on that's good too yeah so great that sounds great um so let's see i wanted to get back to the uh the github and so we have this is our github repo this is our oral group github and i we were talking again jesse and i met yesterday about administrative stuff so we have an administrative uh, repo on the GitHub, and I wanted to show that. That's where we have, well, they have the project posters. And again, this is these are the project posters. So we have these project-oriented posters where we have an idea, which is the topic of the project. And, you know, it, what we, we say it's a project, but it's really just kind of an area that has an idea around it. So, you know, there's this description of this idea and then the idea is to get people to take ownership of the project by be by being inspired by the description they could say oh yeah well, i do something similar this i could fit my work into this and drive it forward um and then there's this deliverable which is the um sort of what we want to do with this with the direction we want to go and that's of course if someone wants to take ownership of it and do something slightly different that's okay but that's really where our goal is. Um, and then there's there, there's the team, there are some presentation, prior presentations or papers or what have you. Uh, there are venues, we really haven't been able to get this uh, follow up on this anywhere, like to talk about it too much. So that's that's been a challenge. Uh, and, you know, but, 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 you know, eventually this will get driven forward. Um, Let's see if there are any other good projects. Reconstructing cybernetics. I think that's, you know, again, if you read through this, you'll find that, you know, there are a lot of interesting things here. Maybe it doesn't make any sense to some people. Other people might be really excited by it. And then, again, our team and our deliverable. So, you know, if we're going to do this for different roles in the lab, then the way we change these cards would be like, instead of the idea, we'd have like a role, defined role, like a model builder. And then we'd have like a description of what the model builder would do, you know, uh, 
you might apply models to different problems. You might apply, um, you know, you might have to present maybe every so often a demo of what you're doing just to show that, you know, show off the different models that you're implementing. Uh, you know, interact with people, getting ideas for uh, the models to build and implement, and then maybe some deliverables, you know, where we could, you know, have like a paper or, you know, some sort of open repo of their work. And then that would be it. And then there's a venue and team, you'd have to fill that out. Um, so yeah, that's what we'd want to do with that. I think that's, it's, it's like I said, it's the flip side of these projects. Um, so I just wanted to go over that. I think we should like make that available in the GitHub. And I want to beef up this administrative and lab management area. And I think Jesse brought something up that was kind of intriguing. And that was that we have this like sort of lab management as a project. So like, you know, people can be, can pick up lab management skills or professional skills uh, as like a, pro a research project almost. You know, uh, you get to basically do research in this area, <laughs> you know, learning how to like manage uh, different research, like a meta, it's almost like meta science. Um, but that's, I mean, that's one way we could sell it too. We could tell people, look, it's like kind of like meta science. You're going to pick up some administrative skills, you know, but, but still you're looking at like how to manage different research projects and how they fit together. And there are a lot of, you know, informatics tools we could use as well. Like if we wanted to figure out like how to fit different areas of research together, um, and then, you know, maybe tell the model builders about it and say, you know, this is how these areas of research fit together. Maybe we can unite some of these areas and, you know, uh, really integrate some of what we're doing. You know, that would work as well. Um, but these are all just kind of ideas that, you know, might be, you know, things that other groups don't necessarily do. But like I said to Jesse yesterday, you know, we're going to have to find a niche where we can kind of contribute to um, that other groups don't really do. So that's something that uh, just to think about again. Um, and so I want to, oh, actually, I want to go to submissions now. So I want to go back to our submissions document. And this is something maybe that we're creating in, um, uh, we're, we're recreate, maybe recreating this at some point in Notion. And so we talked about Notion as a database for uh, managing a lot of this stuff. This is, of course, our publications document. We go through it every week. Um, and we have some, most of the stuff has been addressed, I think, to some extent. Uh, some of it is not, like we have loose ends in here, definitely. Um, we have this, let's see, we have uh, these NeurIPS workshops, which I encourage people to continue to check on to see if there's something that you want to do. Uh, we have the one that we want to work on, the Pragmatics uh, workshop or the MIC workshop. And this again is, and, and I'm going to have to put this together a little bit more. I'm going to actually talk about it in a little bit, what that paper might look like. But I need to write it up a little bit more before I share it with people. But this is the workshop. This is Meaning in Context, Pragmatic Communication in Humans and Machines. And the problem here is that this area is, um, it's focused mostly on language, but it doesn't have to. This has been a wastebasket of language research. So this is something that, you know, people, they're interested in maybe new approaches, maybe different approaches. And so... This is, I think, pra pragmatic reasoning, but also a linguistics component. We don't necessarily have the linguistics component, but we have the pragmatic reasoning component in some of the work we're doing. So um, I'll get to what that might look like in a little bit here. Um, and so there are a bunch of questions that we might align the paper with. Um, and, you know, I don't know, maybe we... Maybe we align, I think it's good to align at least with one of these questions. So uh, actually they're talking about things like neurotypical individuals and communicating agents and uh, how does pragmatics connect to other linguistic, non-linguistic aspects of intelligence. That might actually be one we can really attack 
uh, how might model successes and failures in form theories of human pragmatic reasoning? It's probably not something we can really do, but uh, I mean, you know, so there are a number of different um, topics we, or questions we can sort of address when we write it up. So that's, um, that's what they're looking for. Uh, now, like I said, I'll get to that in a minute, or we're going to go with that. Uh, Neuromatch Academy is still continuing. It's almost over for this year. Um, I think they have one more week of this. So this was the DL, the deep learning version. Uh, the neuro version, of course, is over. And I think that, you know, we didn't participate in NMA as well as we did last year. We didn't we have as deep of involvement in it. But I think it's something that we can still follow up on. Uh, I had some interest in the other group I work with on doing a slow pod where you have this, uh, you know, you take the materials that are presented in the three-week brain dump and you unpack them into like three or four months of going over the topics or just going over certain topics that really interest your research group. So there might be an opportunity there to do some slow pod activities. Um, and yesterday at our uh, research meeting, we also talked about the idea of people doing uh, their own tutorials or their own streams. So like, you know, presenting on something or, you know, doing like a, a session on some topic, some methods topic, you know, it could be like something, uh, you know, from Neuromatch. It could be something really obscure that you'll never be able to really get any expertise in any other way. Um, like I told Jesse, I find that like a lot of the educational opportunities, it's either they kind of go through methods in sort of a, uh, you know, a review fashion where they just give you a little bite of each in a course, or you have to do a very deep dive into it. And that's not, neither of those are really good if you just want a good understanding, a solid understanding of a method. So like for agent-based modeling, you know, what's the proper level of understanding you need to sort of just start building models. Um, you know, that's that's something that, you know, isn't very obvious, but I think it's something we can address. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, let's see, there is the, uh, we have this artificial life special issue. This is the thing, this is where the continual embodied learning paper is going to go. This is due September 18, so that's coming up in the near future. Uh, I have to turn my attention to that to sort of get it back out into the group. Uh, we need to make some changes to it and uh, improve some of the descriptions. So that's, that's not like, you know, it, it won't take a huge amount of work, but it's something we need to turn back to thinking about. Um, there's this Metabrain Models paper, which is something I'm going to talk about next. And these are both, this one's due at the end of the month. And these are both follow-ups from the EI workshop. And then we have this Gibsonian information, which is kind of something we haven't really put out in, in a preprint yet. We submitted it to a couple places. And it's it's an idea, I think, that is still kind of in development. And uh, well, well, we'll we'll maybe turn our attention to that later in the fall. So... Um, so it's always hard to get these things, you know, if you get it like an opportunity, like a deadline for a submission, it always focuses the mind. But these things are, this is still ongoing and it's just kind of sitting there. But um, I think that's it. We've done a lot of stuff here over the last like eight months. So I think this is very, you know, we have a lot of accomplishments to be proud of. Um, and like I said, even things like you know, the ethics and society presentation, which was very broad, we can take little bits of that and drill down and like create new, you know, papers and talks from that. So I don't forget that we have all these things that we've done. And then now we need to like kind of, you know, go back and look and see where we can take things next. And I think a lot of the logical, you know, next steps are to follow up on some of these things that we've submitted or presented on and figure out what the best way forward is. That's usually how people do it. Um, and, you know, we have maybe have a lot to say about something, maybe nothing at all. It's just finding that thing that's exciting to people. Uh, so that, I think that's it for that. Um, 
I don't think there's anything to update on. Like this is, I think, something from Krishna, bias and artificial intelligence. I think he's working on this currently, but I don't know what the status of it is. In any case, uh, that's all we'll talk about maybe next week. So now I wanted to get to this MetaBrain Models paper, and this is a paper on, um, this is a paper that follows up on the talks that, or the ideas we've done with MetaBrain Models. Currently, it's just me and Jesse on this. Um, and the MetaBrain Models are these models where you have the different layers of representation. So you have the, uh, the lower layer of representation, which is the connectionist model, you have higher levels of representation, which have more detail in them in terms of, you know, indirect observations of the world and how to process those things. So you might have like, you know, models where you have a framework that describes components that are, um, you know, whereas connectionism is just making connections between things and generating the outputs there. So all these, these different layers are connected together. You have maybe like a connectionist model finding um, connections between things that gets passed up to another model where you have a framework for classifying things. And then there's this interaction between the two layers that, uh, you know, allows us to put together, uh, you know, maybe something like a neurosymbolic model, which is, I think, a, a good way to think about it. Now, you know, the neurosymbolic people might balk at that, but um, or they might complain about it, but that's, you know, that's just one maybe example of what we're trying to do. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in the, in a very similar spirit. So, um, that's, that's where we're going with this. And, you know, we're kind of in an early stage in the development of this paper, I'm trying to lay out a lot of the prior work. Uh, this, this involves things like embodiment, developmental science, constructivism, and connectionism. Um, in kind of reviewing the literature on this, or at least motivating the study. I don't, we don't really have a, I mean, we have some references, but we need to flesh us out with references. Uh, and that's one of the things actually that, um, if you want to contribute to this paper, you might be able to do is go find some references for some of these things and, you know, uh, make it so that we can really get it to a point where it's really impressive. Um, and then there's a basic architecture, there's a level of representation, so this just kind of talks about different le levels, what it means to be a level, anatomic fidelity, so this is really based on what's going on in the brain and how the brain works. Uh, there's heterogeneity, which is that you just don't have this single, you know, monolithic model, that there's variation within the model, cybernetic regulation, innateness. So another thing we have too is that we have this sort of innateness mechanism that encodes things, you know, from like the birth of the model. And then you also have things that can be expressed, which is to say that you can turn things on and off in the model. And so there, there's this innate component because it's not coming from the environment as an input. It's coming from a separate layer and it's not really considered to be a representational layer because it, it doesn't really directly interact with the rest of the metabrain. It's just kind of underneath and under underpins the metabrain. So uh, then we might talk about development and evolution as sort of general concepts that either inspire what we're doing or sort of shape what we're doing. And then application of metabrains as specific systems. So this is something that needs to be worked out. I don't know if this is gonna be like specific problems which might be useful like you know how do i apply a metabrain to like driving or some other thing actually maybe i should make a note about that um, driving um, data now anal image analysis maybe I don't want to delve too deeply into it because we actually haven't implemented anything to get statistics for like, you know, if you say that this works well with image analysis, then people will want to see the data and 
we don't really have the data for that. We're just suggesting that it might work for that. Um, and then broadening out the context, because this is for the EI workshop, there's a broader context of developmental AI and what we presented on at the workshop on developmental AI. So right now I have a bunch of buzzwords in here and I need to make sure that these are, I don't wanna go through a bunch of buzzwords like this. I wanna break this out and kind of describe maybe some of the other components of our approach and you know, give a good sort of tour of, you know, how this fits into a larger picture. So that's something that, uh, let me make a note here. Yeah. And then I've been busy getting references for different things, for different topics. So there's a nice little bibliography. And again, we need a larger bibliography for this. Um, so, you know, just so that when we say something, we don't just have it sitting in isolation. We need to cite it. Um, so I think it's coming along. And the, the submission for this is, uh, it's due at the end of the month. And they're pretty flexible in terms of how we can submit it. Like, you know, the form we can submit it in. They said we could have a large, uh, a long paper or a short paper. So basically the page limits are like from three pages to like 50 you know, I mean, it, it, it's an ebook, so they're publishing it sort of as this chapter in an ebook. It's it's supposed to be more exploratory, and that's why it's in the state it is, uh, because you know we want to cover a number of topics, and we have the freedom to do that. We just need to make it coherent. So, so that's the MetaBrain models, and I'll put this in the Slack. I know I said I would do it last week, but I didn't want to put it in just in a very uh, proto developmental state. I think it, yeah, I think at this point though, I think I will put it in the Slack channel and ask people if they want to contribute. So I think we're at that point now. So just to give you an update on how that's going. So it looks like Jesse's back. So um, let's see, we have some things in the chat here. Yeah, yeah, Jesse. I'm glad to see Avery here. Yes, Avery's here. Um, yeah, so that's the MetaBrain Models paper. And um, I don't know if anyone had anything to say before we move on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now we'll move on, and we're not quite to papers, but I did want to talk about, uh, I don't know if I have it in here. Um, I had this, I think I had a, oh, here it is, a paper for Pragmatics Conference. So I talked about the Pragmatics Conference, and I said, uh, you know, what? I'm going to take a couple of slides, and I want and I said this about another thing, actually, where you can take a couple of slides and build upon them. And for this Pragmatics Conference, we need something that's about four pages in length. And this is the NeurIPS format, so it's probably about six to eight pages of this format. So what do, what do we want to do? So I have a sort of, I've gotten some, uh, I'm thinking of definitely doing something with contextual geometric structures. And so I, I went back through the last presentation on this topic. And um, so this is the contextual geometric structure, a very basic one. You have these anchor, these linguistic anchors here. This is a phenomenon that has like a sensory range, like from hot to cold or light to dark or some other um, continuum that you might find in the uh, psychophysical world. And you're mapping this to uh, some cultural representation, which then can be, if you have a population of these, can be, uh, you know, you can define different cultures and then see how they overlap, see how there's a distance between them. And it tells you a lot about like how this psychophysical information is represented by these agents in different ways. 
So for example, if you have like an extent from light to dark, um, you know, some cultures will represent certain parts of that continuum in different ways. They might emphasize certain parts of the continuum over others. They might represent most of it or very little of it, uh, depending on what they find important. And so you're going to find the agents who follow these rules uh, will represent things mostly along this, you know, along most of this axis, whereas cultures that don't represent a little bit. So you can see that there's this representation of this uh, continuum for culture A along this part, culture B along this part, and culture C along this part. So some of it is separable and some of it overlaps. Now in this case you have a three tuple, so you have three different continua that you're comparing. So you're comparing hot, cold, light, dark, and maybe like, you know, uh, bitter, sweet, or something like that in terms of taste. We're just taking very abstract linguistic concepts here. But the idea is to like, you know, sort of capture um, a psychophysical um, opposition or continuum. So, you know, it could be any three or four or five things that you want to look at. And the idea is that in culture, um, and maybe more generally in cognition, you know, we do make these combinations of things. Our worlds are, especially like when we look at a naturalistic context, our worlds aren't controlled by like, you know, controlling one variable by another. It's like we have these large number of variables that interact and, you know, you're trying to find sort of, you know, how, you, you know, a person, in this case, or an agent, takes a bunch of different uh, categories or uh, groups of sensory inputs and then creates a representation from the intersection of all of those. So that's, that's basically what we're trying to do. Now there's this other aspect of it, which is you have this conceptual kernel and a sensory kernel. So I've developed this a little bit more to say that like, there's this conceptual kernel where you're taking sensory information and you're putting it into the, actually, I don't know if this is the correct way. Okay, so this is actually the map I wanna show. Uh, so this is where you have this sensory kernel. So you have this sensory input into the agent and the it's, the sensory kernel is a representation of the uh, psychophysical space only. So it's like you're taking things in from the environment and you're mapping them to this space. And, you know, it's like this, again, this continuum of these different uh, properties of nature that, you're that, that are being classified by the sensory system. There's no representation here yet. Now you're gonna map this to a conceptual kernel. So this is the same thing, but now, you're constraining this by like, you know, cultural rule, conventions, meanings, emphases, and things like that. And so you're mapping from the sensory to the conceptual kernel. You're basically creating this map between, you know, if you just have things coming in as, as senses, you know, how do they fit into this? Uh, so if it's like absolute zero, it would be down here on the cold end of the spectrum. If it's like super hot, you know, like as hot, you know, as you can get, it would be up here. But of course, cultures don't represent those extremes because people generally don't experience them. So they map to a slightly different location on this um, on this axis. And so there's this mapping that occurs where we take things that we have as sensory inputs and map them to some cultural representation here. And so this area is, you know, sort of I don't know if you call it isomorphic to this area, but it has a different shape to it. So that's the kind of thing. And so we basically will populate the sensory kernel and then create a reentrant map where we have this, um, first of all, is mapping to the conceptual kernel and then feedback to the sensory kernel as needed. So this is the idea here. And then finally, there's this idea of polysemy. So these conceptual maps, um, will have different meanings for things. So some words will have multiple meanings because you can see that you have these different axes of different things. So it's not just comparing hot and cold, it's comparing these other things like light and dark and other taste attributes. And so those things like you would see with a multi-sensory integration context here, you actually have a little bit, it's a little bit different here because there's a, a semantic aspect where you have like different meanings that intersect instead of different senses that intersect. 
And so in this case, you're going to end up with things that have multiple meanings. So you have objects in the space or locations in the space that can have multiple meanings depending on, you know, which way you look at the, which way you interpret it. So you can imagine that if you intersect by temperature with uh, light, with uh, taste, that, you know, if you're looking at it from a different point of view, you get different meanings for it. And so that's the thing that we might also want to talk about. Now, we don't have to go on, you know, I'm going to try to prepare a, um, a four-page paper to kind of focus on this this area. We'll see if it flies. I don't know. It may fly. And like I said before, we have questions that we can frame these, this around. So there are different questions that they're interested at this workshop. So we frame it around those questions and we kind of, I'll, I'll work on the actual text of the paper and then maybe we can move from there and uh, I know that a couple of people were interested in that I think Avery and uh, Jesse and Charlotte were interested in this as well so uh, I'm gonna just to give you a heads up on what I'm thinking for this and I, I'll prepare a paper and we'll see how far we can get and this this paper is due on the 11th of September so or the 10th of September so, you know, we have a little bit of time for it. Um, it's just a matter of getting it out there and then working on it. Um, but that, I mean, that should be, you know, something. Again, this is how you drive forward some of these ideas. You have to kind of think about them, uh, take what you have, and then try to frame it into a question, a series of questions. And that's how you develop your work. You know, you kind of start working on it and you maybe grab a little piece of it and you try to adopt it, uh, adapt it to some set of questions. And I think that's a, that's a, we'll see how that goes. I don't want to say it's going to be like, it's going to be wonderful, but um, anyways, um, so that's, that's the plan for that paper. Uh, now I wanted to get in some topics that I've kind of collected here. So there's this, uh, kind of topic I ran across this week. And this is, uh, I don't know what's in this one. Oh, okay, this is different. Okay. So this is something called uh, contingency or Markovian versus contingency. So what does that mean? Um, I think it starts with this tweet. I guess this is a good way to frame it. Um, your system isn't Markovian. Knowing its history will provide insights into its current behavior. So if you're familiar with uh, like machine learning models and, and you know some agent-based models and some artificial life, you know that one common way to represent um, different states and the, the transitions between states is to use something called a Markov model. And a Markov model is, is like a, a series of discrete states and you have these arcs between them, which are the transitions. And the idea of a Markov model was to assume that there's no sort of memory of the behavior. And you're just interested in how the system will transition from one state to another. So if you, uh, you know, use a Markovian model or use a Markov model, as it's called, you have these discrete states and you have the transitions between states and you can observe a system over time as either transitioning from one state to another or transitioning to back to its current state. And then you can measure the probabilities of that and you can get a sense of sort of what the system looks like. So this is sort of a mean approach, a mean field approach, which means you're looking at the mean behavior over time. It's useful for a lot of things, uh, looking at different patterns in the data, you know, looking at how the sort of the dynamical system, it evolves as a dynamical system and things like that. So there are a lot of ways in which that can be exploited. However, this, this observation here is that your system isn't Markovian, knowing its history will provide insights into its current behavior. So a Markov model is memorialist. It doesn't have a history. It just shows you the outputs, right? It just emits these outputs that are transitions or it stays in its same state. And that's what you have to work with. This The model doesn't remember anything and it can't integrate on the history. So that's, it's both advantageous and a problem. But there have been like, so people have kind of touched upon this issue over time. And so if you go back to 1993, there's a paper at 
uh, NURIPS, and at the time it was called NIPS, and um, it is by Yashua Bengio, this is before he got into deep learning, um, and it's called Credit Assignment Through Time, Alternatives to Back Propagation. And so this is sort of a move away from this idea of a memoryless system. So what they're trying to do here is they're trying to learn learn to recognize or predict sequences using long-term context, right? So they wanna know like if you can take a model and uh, sort of figure out what the sequences are and then use that history to inform the model in terms of its long-term context. So my Markov model generally doesn't have a history, but I can record the history as a sequence of, of state changes. So a good way to think intuitively to think about this is coin flipping. If I flip a coin, it will either end up heads or tails. And I can build a Markov model of this. I can have heads as one state, tails as another state, and then I can model the transitions. So it actually looks something like this. And I'm gonna draw uh, some uh, Markov models. So bear with me here. So this is, these are the two states for a coin flip heads and tails, right? And you could think of a coin as just this thing you flip and it's, so then you have this, these two arcs here, you have tails to heads and heads to tails. So there's a transition there when you have, uh, you know, you have, uh, you, so you have a, a coin, you flip it, it's heads, you flip it again, it's either heads or tails. If it's tails, then it makes this transition between heads and tails. If it stays the same, it's heads to heads. Furthermore, you can have like a transition from tails back to heads and then tails to tails. And these all have a probability associated with them. So technically, uh, there's a probability of going from heads to tails, it's 50%. Tails to heads, it's 50%. And then there is actually, uh, it's not actually 50 because you have these uh, probabilities of staying in the same state. And you know that if you've ever seen a, a, a series of coin flips, you know that although the probability of flipping uh, is 50%, the actual pattern is often not 50 because you have runs of heads or runs of tails over time. So if you flip a coin for 10 flips, what will generally happen is you won't get heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, you'll get some sequence where it's like tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, and that. So basically you're getting this sort of uh, behavior that isn't like deterministic. It's more random behavior where, uh, or stochastic behavior, where any of these states are sort of plausible at any time, but it's just the question of, you know, how the coin is flipping. And, um, you know, I think people have, kind of studied this and there's no magic to it. It's just kind of a stochastic process. So that's where they're coming from on this. And there's no real, uh, you know, there's no real way to predict whether something will be heads or tails. But if you can take that se those sequences, long-term sequences, and look at those and give the model that information, then the model no longer operates um, on this sort of Markov model. It's a Markov model, but it also has information about these runs. So the probabilities are gonna be different. Plus the behavior of the model is going to be different because it's informed by these runs that these things exist in the world. And so this is, uh, so in this paper, they, they wanna do this, they wanna create these long-term, this long-term context by looking at these sequences. Uh, however, practical and theoretical problems are found in training recurrent neural networks to perform tasks of which input output dependencies span long intervals. Uh, starting from a mathematical analysis of the problem, we consider and compare alternative algorithms and architectures on tasks for which the span of the input output dependencies can be controlled. So these input output dependencies are, um, oh, they might talk about it on the paper. Um, so at the time they had some algorithms that they were working on this problem. Um, so neural networks have been considered to learn to map input sequences to output sequences, right? So that's what a neural network does. Machines that could efficiently learn such tasks would be useful for many applications involving sequence prediction, recognition, or production. 
Um, so let's see. In fact, we can prove that dynamical systems such as recurrent neural networks will be increasingly difficult to train the gradient descent as the duration of the dependencies to be captured increases. So this is a problem in terms of like if you're thinking about gradient descent, which is a stochastic process, if you have these dependencies, um, you know, the, basically what they're saying is if you have a longer history, the reason they use Markov models in, in the sort of memory memoryless approach is because it allows you to minimize the energy of the model or the, the error of the model. And so you can use gradient descent and it's a stochastic process by which you just decrease the error, or decrease the energy of the model. And so the idea here is that these dependencies are, uh, as they increase, you know, the ability to sort of use these it, or train these models is harder. Um, maybe some of that is because you have to incorporate much more information. Maybe some of that is it's not um, particularly amenable to, you know, we don't really know why, but, uh, but anyways, it's not amenable to the, the approach. So that, you know, but so in the first case, the dynamics of the network allow it to reliably store bits of information with bounded input noise, but gradients with respect to an error at a given time step vanish exponentially fast as one propagates them backward in time. In the second case, the gradients can fall backward, but the system is locally unstable and cannot be reliably store bits of information in the presence of input noise. So there's this interesting connection between gradients and between Markov models and then this history that you can give the model. So they kind of work on this. They work on some alternative algorithms and architectures. And remember, this is from 1993. So they're thinking in terms of, uh, you know, they're kind of eliminating the kinds of models that you can use. So uh, they're looking at these artificial tasks in which the span of input output dependencies can be controlled. A duration pa parameter was varied from t over 2 to t, which short sequences in which the algorithm could much more easily learn. So these tasks require learning to latch or store bits of information for arbitrary durations. So this is where they'd have to store a memory. So such tasks cannot be performed by time delay neural networks or by recurrent networks. The memories are gradually lost with time constants that are fixed by the parameters of the network. So, you know, uh, this is a design feature of a lot of neural networks. So of all the alternatives to gradient descent that we've explored, an approach based on a probabilistic interpretation of a discrete state space, similar to hidden Markov models, yielded the most interesting results. So there are these other tools called hidden Markov models. And so if we go back to our model of these two states, the hidden Markov model is where you have these two states, but there are hidden states that we don't know about. So there are all these hidden states that are like, you know, um, Maybe there are two hidden states in this where we know and you know there are transitions between the heads and tails on each of these or we don't really know what they are but we know that there's some transition to it so like um you know these could be sides of the coin beside one and side two and so these sides of the coin are going to be like if you flip the coin and it ends up on its side which is a little implausible but let's say for the case of this for the sake of this example that that's what happens so we don't know these state these states exist uh off the bat from what we observe because what we observe is like a limited sequence but we do know that they exist and if we have enough data we can find them but we can't really find them if we use a markov model because it's only describing the heads and tails so we need to expand our, our sort of description area or description space and so that's where we end up with these hidden states so to find these hidden states, we need to use a different type of model. And that's where the hidden Markov model comes into play. Hidden means that the states, there are states that are hidden uh, that describe more of the system. And this is, of course, what our history does. And so this is what they're, they're going with in this paper. And so they kind of go through the math of this. They talk about how they set it up, the architecture, and then the results and the conclusion. So the, the conclusion is, is that recurrent networks and other par uh, parametric dynamical systems are very powerful in their ability to represent and use context. Um, 
However, theoretical and experimental evidence shows the difficulty of assigning credit through many time steps, which is required in order to learn to use and represent context. So they can actually, um, I'm trying to figure out what this means. Uh, so the whole point here is this is one of the first papers that I know if you uh, have attended Neuromatch, you've heard of this idea of credit assignment. And credit assignment is where you assign in a neural network, I guess you're assigning like a specific path or a specific neuron to some role. And so this is what they're kind of getting at with this. You're able to trace back the steps through the network and figure out what, you know, what's being represented by what. And so that's what they're kind of trying to link it to here. I think the basic message here though, is that they're looking at gradient descent. And they're saying, well, gradient descent doesn't allow you to look at the history of a system. Gradient descent is tied to this Markovian model of the world, in, in which case you have to say that the world just operates as a series of transitions between states. Now, we can't really predict you know, things from the history. We can't really, you know, there, there's a bit about future prediction in there that are all kind of like, you know, the assumption is, is that the world is sort of this stochastic event machine. And so that that's kind of the lesson from this. Um, and so that's, that's an older paper. This paper here is, uh, this is a little bit above, I think, all of our ability here, but I'm going to kind of show it because I think it's kind of gets into some of these issues. So uh, in the abstract, I'll just kind of try to go through the abstract a little bit. Um, so this abstract has an important class of random walks. And so random walks are, if you have, if you go back to this model, a random walk would be a path through this model. So it would be like, if I go heads to heads to heads to tails to heads to tails to tails to heads, that's a path, all right? And again, this is a path that we can take and record as a historical event, all right? And um, so we can take these random walks through this network. We don't have to just take like a deterministic path. A random walk is like, if I just decide to go, uh, my system decides it's either gonna like go heads to heads or heads to tails and it's kind of a random decision as to where to go next. And then you assemble the sequence based on this random walk, just the, the algorithm just picks one state or another and then outputs a sequence. So it's sort of like this idea that there's this randomness, it's kind of like flipping a coin um, and you'll, you'll take a random walk through that. So th those are random walk models. Um, and then, so an important class of these type of models includes those in which the random increment at time step T depends on the complete history of the process. So you have to know the hist complete history of the process, which we often don't know, but we have to know something about like how the system behaves. And in fact, in the case of a coin flip, we kind of know how the system behaves, but only very generally. We can assign probabilities to these transitions. But again, we can observe a lot of cases where those probability, we deviate from those probabilities because they're, they are summary statistics. They don't, they're not deterministic. And so uh, we have to know the history, uh, but, but we, you know, it's going to depend on how we characterize it. We consider a recently proposed discrete time non-Markovian random walk process characterized by a memory parameter P. So now they're moving away from Markovian models and they're moving using a random walk process. They use a memory parameter, which gives them this memory so that they can draw from it to make the next state and to make a prediction on the, the behavior of the system. We numerically calculate the first and second moments of the position distribution, which are basically like mean and standard deviation uh, and relate our results to known analytic results for special cases. We obtain data collapse for the position distribution. I don't know exactly what data collapse is, but we study the effect of reducing the memory by considering a modified model in which only a fraction F of previous steps are remembered. So this is playing around with the memory to try to figure out what parts of the memory are useful or most predictive. Um, and so surprisingly, the behavior becomes Markovian for small f. So for these small fractions of previous steps, the behavior is essentially Markovian. So it doesn't actually help you at all. Even though the correlation time diverges from f 
uh, larger than zero. We also study the transient effects near the memory edge by considering a Markovian limit on the original model. We observe crossover to Markovian behavior for times much larger than the range of the memory. So in other words, you know, you, if you have no memory, it's Markovian. If you have a little bit of, or a sparse memory, it's Markovian. You really have to have a lot of memory in the system to make it non-Markovian. And thus to sort of match what we see in the real world with a lot of complex systems. So, you know, this is, we can classify correlations as either having a short range, in which case we can model them using Markov processes, or else having a long range, in which case one essentially has a non-Markovian process. And this goes back again to this coin flip. The coin flip is generally thought of as a very short range behavior. You flip a coin and it comes out heads or tails, it's stochastic. You don't need a memory to, to make a distinction here. You know what your states are, you know what, that it's a stochastic process, so the probability is likely 50-50. But of course, over time we see these runs. And so why do we see them? Um, it's because random processes behave like that. But moreover, you know, maybe having a memory of that, if it's not like a totally stochastic system, is quite useful to predict to refine your, your transitions and their probabilities. So if you have something that's less stochastic, like you know, uh, people moving from city to city over time, that's not stochastic. That has actually some structure to the data. And so then we, if we have a memory of what people have done in the past, it, it's actually informative to the system. So I think that's this paper actually is quite, you know, it's pretty involved. It's, it's a physics paper. But if you're really kind of looking for the take home message, I think that's it, that you just really have that role of memory. Finally, there's this issue of contingency. So, you know, we've talked about contingency in our group. This is a slide from the uh, stuff that we've done on, um, on Gibsonian information. This is contingent action. So this is a movie of people running down a hill with a Zorb ball chasing them. And in this picture we have, uh, I think this is the one where it's the full video where you see the action, the people running from the ball, the ball rolling down the hill. In this case, some frames have been cut out of it. So we've lost some of the memory of this process. So from this one, we could maybe predict what the next frame should be as we see the action here. We see the ball coming down the hill, we see people running from it. And we can predict that the ball is going to keep rolling down the hill and probably crush some other people here. Um, but in this case, you know, the videos are all chopped out. So we have an incomplete memory of what's going on. So maybe we can predict what happens and maybe we don't because we don't have all the historical information in this one. So uh, this actually leads to, to give us some sort of contingency tree. So from uh, this contingency tree, you know, you start at a certain state and you follow the action and you say, if this sort of thing happens, what's the next thing that's going to likely happen? So you can map out like a scene or you can map out some system using a contingency tree. And it's, you know, it's very logical. You have these, you know, if something happens or doesn't happen, this is the next step. Then there are two other things that might happen that result from the next step and so on and so forth. And you end up at the tips of this tree with discrete outcomes that have this, you can trace this back. So this is almost like credit assignment in this contingency tree, where each uh, node here represents a decision point or a piece of historical information. And we can say, well, you know, there's a transition from that piece of information to another piece of information, and we can build these paths through the contingency tree. Now with this video, we can actually draw this out quite easily and trace back because so it's reversible. In this case, though, it's a little harder because we don't have all the information. So now if we knock out parts of this history, then it becomes a little harder to predict what that, ne or that next step or if we do a reversible thing what that previous step should have been. And so this uh, actually interferes with our ability to, uh, you know, to interpret this, these uh, current states properly because we don't know how it ended up the way it is. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of like, kind of speculating about this contingency tree and its connection back to some of the ideas that we just talked about with credit assignment 
and with historical memory of, of these computational systems. Um, but, you know, we do have this issue in development of contingency, and we do have this issue, it's very explicit in development, where you have, you start off at a single point and you get more complexity as you go through development, as things differentiate, as you acquire things. So in developmental biology, you often have cells that divide and differentiate. In developmental psychology, you're dealing with things that are, you know, you're acquiring new pieces of information. And depending on what you learned previously, that gives you some new hole to, you know, understand things. And it depends on maybe on the order you learn things or what you learn that depends where you end up in this contingency tree. So, you know, it's, again, it's this possibility space across, uh, you know, what you learn and depending on what you're, you know, what, what comes before it, you end up with this path through development. And so this is, again, an example of an agent developing where you have these different germ layers that turn into these effectors and sensors and, um, a uh, central nervous system emerging. This is uh, something I presented to my other group in a little bit more detail, but this is something, again, from the uh, developmental brain where vehicles work. So this is something that is um, where you have these different parts that are starting to emerge and differentiate in different ways. And so, and you can draw a tree of this and a contingency tree at that because some of these things, like these sensors and effectors, rely on this germ layer to be formed and if it's not formed of course then you don't get any sensors and effectors and so this is something where in development this contingency is very strong it you know it, it you rely on one thing to produce another thing so those are all you know this is a very different way i think of thinking about complex systems we think about like you know just throwing a machine learning algorithm or a deep learning algorithm at a problem we don't really think about the contingency of, of action too much. And so I think that's an important point. But going back to this original tweet, then you have this system that isn't Markovian, but you know you need to know the history. You can improve the insights into the current behavior. But of course, the Markovian model isn't really about insights. It's about prediction. So that sets up this difference between insight versus prediction. And of course, that's something that's a different issue altogether. So. Any questions about that? Any observations, comments? I found the models um, of how development can converge or de de diverge very interesting in general. I am um, interested. I'd actually like to learn detail CGS more too. Okay. Yeah, we, we have some resources on YouTube. Um, we have a couple of lectures on it um, on the YouTube channel. Um, and I know it's like, you know, it, like I present things in, in, in it, you know, it may, may be clear, it may not be clear, but um, I might go over, maybe next week, I might go over some things on CGS a little bit more. Um, but yeah, there are things on the YouTube channel that are useful in terms of like prior talks. I think there's a playlist for CGS stuff. Um, because I, I've had like, you know, we kind of started working on it and it's like one of those things that you really need a lot of background to really appreciate. <laughs> like the background is like sort of self-referential and that we need to like create sort of tutorials for it and, you know, concepts and, but those are all like, we have actually a playlist on YouTube for that. So you might check that out and it might give you a little bit more insight into that. Um, as for the developmental stuff, yeah, I think that is definitely there's a nice connection between like some of the statistical models that we've been working with or, or we talk about a lot and then, um, you know, developmental processes and that's sort of the developmental AI aspect is, is that, you know, maybe we want to bridge that a little bit more explicitly. Like, you know, if we're doing, it's not just that you use development as a way to sort of shape the model. It's that there are actually statistical consequences. So, for example, if we just apply a machine learning algorithm, you know, there's no memory, then we can't really get a good context. 
um, development, we know like people talk about like you know um, interact you know interactivity and, and what uh, the term uh, like constructivism, where you know the the agent of, develops with its environment, so it basically has a very rich dialogue with the environment. And so, if you think about like having a rich dialogue with history <laughs> or historical events, uh, modern algorithms don't have that, and so they need maybe they need to have that to be much more insightful. And thanks for the comments, Avery. Hey, I'm, I'm here for a moment. Um, I missed some of the papers, some of the stuff earlier, but any particular highlights that have been being um, last like hour that I missed? Um, well, I just talked about the uh, contingency stuff. Um, there are a couple of papers in the repository. I can put that on um, the Slack. There are just a couple of papers in there that I pointed to. There's this classic paper by, um, let me share my screen again. There's this classic paper by um, uh, Bengio that you might want to check credit assignment through time. So I know you've heard of credit assignment um, and it just kind of talks about credit assignment as an alternative to back propagation. It's, it's in a classic paper. I mean, it's not like not the state of the art in terms of, uh, you know, technology, but they're really kind of getting at. And actually the issues they get to, we're still dealing with because these are the basic models that we still work with. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, I'll, I'll put some of these on on the, or on the Slack, so we can get a sense of what what okay. to read. Yeah, and I think that's Avery that's here with us too, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, I know you're got things to do today, so uh, yeah. thanks for being here. And I, uh, I don't think I need to show the final actuals here, so uh, yeah. To see people. I, I, I kind of want to head out again, but um, I'll follow up the meeting. Okay. Yeah. Have a good uh, talk to you later. <laughs> All right. I think the long term, no, I think the long term interest of mine is basically kind of combining something similar to developmental con contingencies with CTS, mapping out the commensurate dimorphisms and uh, even in both the physiological, aesthetic, and social and functional, I think that'd be interesting. Yeah, I remember you were showing me some of that work. It's very interesting, and I thought there were a lot of interesting parallels of CGS. And you know, it, I know we never really followed up on it too much, but it was, uh, yeah, that's something definitely we should br you should bring back into the meetings as some of your drawings. Yeah, that could be like that could be like a whole project. Um, so like this upcoming fall, honestly. So I think I think it might be good to even advertise for the, the CGS thing itself. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. yeah, yeah. I definitely want to continue on that, but yeah, it's been super swamped. But yeah, I'd love to see how that might be further articulated by something like CGS or developmental contingencies, because it really is about like. I, I really think there is something in the idea that there's a really fundamental way of making sense of how we interact with other people and the world through the lens of like di different developmental stages and processes leading to different kinds of social and functional roles that, for people. Yeah. I was going to like try to apply that to um I know gender and sex are different, but I was gonna to try to apply that to like clownfish. Okay. Or uh what was it called? That one neotenous salamander. Uh it's cute looking in pink. Oh, the axolotl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think it'd be interesting to model under like a developmental contingencies 
I don't think we have the same social thing going on. I think clownfish and hyenas do, though. I think that'd be interesting to, like, try to model that out and illustrate that within those frameworks. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. And my other group, we talk about axolotls a lot. And so that's, but yeah, they're a very good model for like regeneration mm -hmm. and development. I think I might actually play with that. I'll, I'll get back to you on that for sure. Okay, yeah, yeah that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there's yeah a lot of stuff to do there. I mean, just like in terms of trying to figure out what's, because, you know, you, you create a model and then you think about the implications of it and then, are you capturing something really fundamental about the world and, and about, you know, there's there's a connection between learning and what we call morphogenesis and like sort of, you know, the structural stuff. And yeah, it's, it's but it's, you know, it's always, there are a lot of insights to be made there, I think. Yeah, totally agree. I think like even today, somewhat, I got a conversation where I am about like why people like flowers Mm -hmm. And I highly suspect it has to do with a kind of developmental gender and power, gender and power-ish dimorphisms that we a form of visual language that we that ascribe onto the, to decorative items like flowers. Yeah. Yeah. Flowers actually, there's actually research about um, the morpho how the morphology of flowers evolved to um, attract and be compatible with different pollinators that I actually want to read about. Oh yeah, co-evolution of uh, flowers and, and uh, bees, yeah, <laughs> that they advertise their sort of, advertise themselves to the pollinators and then, yeah. The birds and the bees. Right. <laughs> I think there's something similar, yeah, in dating, but I think even just in, like, the way we just generically socially interact with each other is, like, that kind of fitting into different roles with each other of attraction, uh, purposeful action, recognition of different niche roles, niche regulatory roles. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty good. Pretty good stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully we can follow up on it. Let me know if you have any questions or need any uh, help with anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I'm going to go through maybe one or two more things here. Um, I think, let's see. Uh, so this is a paper for the pragmatics course. It's Markovian stuff. Um, I think I will talk about uh, this this is an interesting blog post here, and I know we talked about. Um, actually, there was a, a thing a couple weeks ago where, I think it, I don't know if it was OpenAI or some group like that where they had made a lot. They had, there was a lot of fanfare like a year or two ago where they were going to build this uh, robot that was going to you know take over the world, and uh, that it was like in a really you know, be a, a step forward in robotics and robots interacting with the world. And I guess they canceled the project recently because they found that they really couldn't do that. That they found that the world was much more complex than they thought. So this is not surprising to anyone who has a really good grasp of the history of AI. But, you know, sometimes we uh, get really optimistic and, you know, uh, try to promise thing, a lot of things to people. Um, but, you know, that's, again, I've learned our lessons, I guess. I don't know. Um, but this was a blog post that came, like, after this, or maybe, I don't, it was before this. It was 2017. But I think this has, a, this is a nice sort of anecdote to what I'm, the story I just told you. And that is, reality has a surprising amount of detail. So this blog post talks about 
this uh, person talks about, um, you know, doing things in the physical world, like replacing fences, digging trenches, building floors and flooring and sheds. And if there's one thing I learned from all this building, it's that reality is a surprising amount of detail. And so this, this, this is, this turns out to explain why it's so easy for people to end up intellectually stuck, even though when they're literally the best in the world in their field. And so this is where you have this example basement stairs. So stairs pre seem pretty simple at first, and at a high level they are simple, just two long wide parallel boards of a certain size, some boards for the stairs and an angle bracket on each side hold up each stair. Okay, so that's like one component and then it's replicated. So, you know, you might think, okay, I can create a representation of this. I can say that there's this component, this module that has like these boards, connectors, and then I can just replicate this across and build stairs. But as you actually start building, you'll find that there's a surprising amount of nuance. The first thing you'll notice is there are actually quite a few subtasks. Even at a high level, you have to cut both ends of the 2x12s at the correct angles, then screw in some U-brackets to the main floor to hold the stairs in place. Then screw the 2x12s into the U-brackets, then attach the angle brackets for the stairs, then screw in the stairs. So this is in a, a picture of what uh, the author is talking about. You need to put all these into place. To put these into place, you need to follow a bunch of steps that are sort of sub-goals and, you know, this is the so this is makes it a little bit harder if you think about this as a robot doing this if you asked a robot to build stairs they would have to sort of learn all these different sub goals and so this is something of course that they've worked on in robotics in terms of goals and sub goals so like the old-fashioned robotics approach was to say you know we'll create this task hierarchy where you know you have goals and sub goals and the robot will sort of uh you know, move along this path, this hierarchical system of goals and sub goals and build things. Um, so, you know, you can build a, a, a tree uh, of different tasks and you can make it very detailed. But the question is, you know, how detailed do you need to be and how much variation is there between different parts? So, as I said before, the stairs are like a series of sort of modules that are in place. You know how how much do those differ? How much do those things present challenges individually as you're building the stairs downward? You're you're putting what's well, basically the same procedure in place multiple times. Is it always the same procedure, or do you run into challenges at each step? And so that's that's kind of what the uh, the you know this is where you get this ever expanding detail. Um, so. <clears throat> You'll probably also want to look up what are reasonable angles for stairs. What looks reasonable when you're cutting and what feels safe can be different. Also, you're probably going to want to attach a guide for your circular saw when cutting the angles because the cut has to be pretty straight. So there are a lot of things here that are details that uh, a robot may be programmed to do, but if you're not programming it to do all of these things and to make these sort of uh, what could be called intuitive judgments, uh, they won't happen. So this is, I think this was interesting in the context of robotics, in the context of, um, this is uh, some important details in colonizing the universe. So this is where um, I guess you get into this idea of like designing a probe to um, explore the universe and all the details involved in that in sort of predicting how that mission should go and so this is just a thing to stress the complexity of that process uh, so if you wish not to get stuck to seek to perceive what you have not yet perceived and of course that's an issue in a lot of uh, ai that we don't really have you know if we don't have a good model for something or if we don't have, if we don't have the data, that's one thing. But if we don't have the interpretive model or how to interpret that data, even if we get it, that's another thing. And that's that's where you you have this problem of something you haven't yet perceived. Um, and so that's that paper. Um, I'm going to talk about this paper because it's been sitting in here for a long time, and I feel like it's been neglected. This is something Jesse sent me 
a long time ago. And this is on the paradigm of altruistic suicide in the unicellular world. So this is a bit biological, um, but let's see. Um, actually, it has a lot to do with altruism. So maybe uh, Avery and, and Jesse, well, you know, Avery, of course, is doing the thing with altruism. Uh, Jesse's interested in it, too. Anyway, in any case, uh, altruistic suicide is best known in the context of program cell death and multicellular individuals. So program cell death is this method that cells use to sort of, uh, you know, some cells, you know, they don't just replicate ad infinitum. Sometimes they have a role to play in the organism and then they die after a certain number of divisions. So this can be interpreted as altruism. This can also be interpreted as sort of a program process. Um, but, but in this case, they're interpreting it as altruistic suicide. Um, so this program cell death can be understood as an adaptive process that contributes to the development and functionality of the organism. So in the brain, we know that there we, you know, you have this proliferation of cells and then you have this sort of uh, program cell death of some cells because you get overproduction of cells because the process isn't precise. But when you start using your neurons and your, you know, neurons get connected, not all cells have a role to play. And so you get this program cell death. You also see this in places like the eye field in development where you get this uh, single eye field and then there's this program cell death in the middle of the eye field to make sure that you have two eyes instead of one. And this is the language I'm using is all very sort of intentional, but there's this process by which the cells are shaped into these two cell fields instead of one and program cell death is a way to make that happen. So these are all things, but, but if you think about cells in terms of this collective behavior context, then altruistic suicide makes sense as an explanation. So uh, after the realization that the PCD white processes can also be induced in single cell lineages, which are uh, where you have this lineage of cells that where they, you know, you have a mother cell divides into daughter cells and you can trace those through and they have, sometimes they have specific functions in that lineage. Um, the paradigm of altruistic cell death has been extended to include these active cell death processes in unicellular organisms. So this is where they take this paradigm from multicellular organisms where you have this functional sort of niche in a, in a group of cells, in an organ or in, a, in development. And they're now moving this to unicellular organisms where you have colonies maybe, or you have, they all live in sort of proximity and they're all competing for resources or sometimes cooperating um, you know, if they live in a colony or something, a loosely associated colony. Um, so here we critically evaluate the current conceptual framework and the experimental data used to support the notion of altruistic suicide in unicellular lineages and proposing perspectives. We argue that importing the paradigm of altruistic cell death from multicellular organisms to explain active cell death and unicellular lineages has the potential to limit the types of questions we ask, thus biasing our understanding of the nature, origin, and maintenance of this trait. We also emphasize the need to distinguish between the benefits and adaptive role of a trait. Lastly, we provide an alternative framework that allows for the possibility that active death in single cell organisms is a maladaptive trait, maintained as a byproduct of selection and pro-survival functions. So this is where you have things that are being selected for for survival and you have this trait that you know it's maladaptive and it's sort of an outcome of you know uh doing things to increase your survival uh but that could under conditions in which kin group selection can act be co-opted into an altruistic trait so this is something that if you have this level of group selection it can be altruistic but if it's individual selection or, you know, selection at the level of the individual organism, in this case, a single cell, it can be maladaptive. So it's an interesting uh, problem, the problem of self-induced death and evolutionary conundrum. So this is really, it goes back to Darwin, uh, who said natural selection will never produce in any being any structure more injurious than beneficial to that being, where natural selection acts solely by and for the good of each. 
No organ will be formed for the purpose of causing pain or for doing an injury to the possessor. So this is uh, 19th century jargon, you know, like, um, but basically the idea is that um, natural selection will produce things that are beneficial to the organism, not maladaptive. Um, and that if it's maladaptive, it's some outcome of, well, it, actually Darwin, I don't think really thought of it that way, but you know, that everything natural selection produces is generally uh, beneficial. And so um, that's, that's what this basically means. Um, and so they kind of go through this idea of, uh, they, actually they talk about selection acting at different levels, which is actually somewhat controversial, but let's assume that, you know, group selection is just as prevalent as individual selection. Um, this is something that you can switch between in, in groups of organisms, so you can have individual selection, you can have group selection, and then death can also occur at multiple levels. So there's this, basically this, not only do you have different levels of selection, but you have different levels of selection pressure. So you have selection pressure at the group level, you have selection pressure at the individual level. And um, so there's this, uh, there's this, so within this framework, selection is expected to promote the evolution of various molecular, physiological, and behavioral mechanisms or adaptations that increase an individual's ability to avoid death. So, but in this case, you have programmed death. So why would you have programmed death if were, the cells are always trying to maximize their fitness and their survival? And so here they have a glossary of terms. Um, and this kind of goes through some of the things that they talk about. Again, like I said before in the meeting, these terms are very important to get very precise, um, but it kind of goes through some of these ideas and they're, the terms that they use and the, the tight definitions. So um, I'm, not really, and I'm not really sure what my opinion is on this paper. I think it's interesting to think about um, program cell death in this way. I've not really thought, ever thought about it in this way, but um, I mean, I know that like program cell death in a lot of, in, in multicellular organisms generally, um, you know, like I said, you'll have program cell death to reach a larger outcome. So like, you know, cells will program themselves to die in order to say, create a larger structure in the organism, like an eye field or a set of eyes, or like in the brain to sort of uh, refine function, or even like in, in terms of like, if the, if the cell goes towards a cancer phenotype, sometimes it will, you know, undergo program cell death to make sure that it doesn't become this metastasizing thing in the body. And so, you know, all these things can happen. Um, and of course, the, you know, if you look at it in terms of selection, you think, well, you know, this is obviously some sort of group selection on the, at the level of the individual cell, um, you know, that they they will take the hit for the good of the team, as it were. So um, that's an, you know, there's a lot of, I think a lot of interesting ideas in this paper. Um, yeah, so it's very, it's very controversial and, and there's no real consensus on it. Uh, they talk about the way cells can die. Uh, there's necrosis, there's programmed cell death, which is where it just goes through a number of divisions and then dies. Um, there's also like, if it reaches a certain stage of development or, you know, sometimes there's autophagy or um, necroptosis. So if the cell is like getting sick, as it were, it dies. There are a lot of ways in which this death can kick in. And so, um, they just kind of go through those examples. And it could be that it's just a totally autonomous process. There's the possibility that it's just basically, if they're the right signals, if it's like, if the cell gets injured, it dies. And, you know, maybe that's good for the organism, not necessarily for the cell, but maybe it doesn't really matter because the cell's dying and it doesn't really matter. It's not gonna survive one way or another. So there's no fitness imperative to speak of. So that, you know, they go through these issues. I think it's kind of, it's nice it sets up this debate. I don't know if the debate is really that, uh, how relevant it is necessarily to multicellular life, but I think definitely we have, okay, so we have this table 
proposal rules for active death in unicellular lineages. So we have these different examples of proposed rules for cell death. We have examples of where you can find them in the literature. So we have examples from bacteria, yeast, dinoflagellites, uh, uh, trypanosoma, and some others, dictostelium. And you have, so, you know, there are different functions. There's development in bacteria, in bacterial colonies, release of nutrients when resources are limiting, so it means a cell will die and release its nutrients to the rest of the cells in the area. Regulating population size and limiting environments. So when there's a starvation situation, population doesn't overgrow its resources. The removal of mutated and damaged cells, this happens in yeast and bacteria and dictostelium, which are these slime molds. Um, removal of weak, unhealthy, or sterile cells protection for surviving cells, um, avoiding a host death or dispersal, which you can mean like it just moves, it, it enables cells to move. Uh, so all these things are really beneficial at the group level and individual cells pay the price. But the question is, is whether that really matters or, or whether it is this sort of altruism. And so I um, would take a look at this paper and I'll post this as well. So that's all I have to say for today. I know that was a little bit um, over, but that's okay. Um, so next week, I think, okay, I'm trying to get my camera back on here. So next week, I think we'll talk about um, some more papers and we'll maybe try to advance the ball on some of the administrative stuff. And maybe we'll have uh, people, if, if you want to present anything, uh, any ideas, even if they're really rough ideas, I welcome you to present something. Uh, we're also reaching uh, maybe a deadline on some papers, so I'll try to get some work done this week and, and maybe present on maybe a little bit more on the Metabrain Models paper and this uh, CGS paper, you know, kind of get it into shape. So, okay, uh, anything else we want to talk about before we go or? My heart, heart actually brought, brought up the uh, controversy, controversy around, around um, group evolution versus individual evolution. I think you actually mentioned um, altruistic cell death specifically. I'll have to ask you again about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll put the paper in the Slack so you know if you have the reference. But yeah, that is a nice controversy. I'm not really sure what the state of the art is there because there's a lot lot going on um, with people <laughs> going back and forth on it. So. Yep. yep. I, forgot I forgot the contact. You mentioned, mentioned it in, so it'll be interesting to ask. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, thanks for attending, and we'll catch up on Slack throughout the week and hope to see you next week. See you, see you next week. week. See you. Take care.